May I preach to you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Even though I usually get my news online when I'm brave enough to endeavor to find out what's still going on in the world, I will actually go and buy a newspaper. Those print things that they still make, you know? Because I know that there are two sections of the newspaper that tell me everything I need to know about what's going on in the world. The first one is the Sunday comics. Because if you know what people are finding funny, then you have an idea about what's going on in the thought process of the people who are writing it and the people who are reading it. The Sunday comics was also the first thing I ever learned to read, so it's kind of nostalgic. The second thing are the obituaries. And the reason I read the obituaries is because it helps me to see what the most important things are to people and their families at the time of death. In other words, at the time of crisis, at the time of sorrow and mourning, you read an obituary and you get an idea about this was the most important aspects of a person's life. What troubles me when I read many of these obituaries is that there's very little mention about the saintly lives that many of these people lived. Now sometimes it's because, you know, they may live a saintly life and it's in obscurity, not many people may know about what they did. Or maybe their families didn't know a lot and, you know, we kind of live in the society where it's frowned upon to toot one's own horn. But I think some of it has to do with the fact that we've kind of moved back from the idea of talking about Jesus Christ openly that we've moved back a little bit from talking about our lives of faith so that other people can hear and be encouraged. And so what ends up happening is you get a slice of life from this person about where they went to school, who they were married to, the number of children and grandchildren they had, which are all wonderful things, but you miss out on some very important details of their spiritual life. Sometimes they don't even mention that the person went to church. And I think that a lot of this starts and has started all the way back in educating young people. So pastor, preacher, and author John Piper was invited to speak at one of the largest gatherings of youth at a university, one of those big youth days where all the people came out onto the, the quad and the lawn and got out their beach chairs and their towels and listened to preachers and musicians for all day. And he decided, I'm going to take a slightly different approach than many of these other preachers. He said one line that I think just resonated with everybody, but they weren't sure immediately why. He said, don't waste your life. Now, usually when we're telling that to a young person, we're telling them, you know, don't fall into the traps of sin. Drugs, sex, rock and roll. Sorry about the rock and roll part. And so as a result, you know, sometimes we're just thinking only about those things. But he said, no, that's not what I'm talking about today. You know those things are wrong. When I say don't waste your life, I mean don't waste your life chasing the wrong things. Because so many young people, and I remember when this sermon came out, I was one of those young people he was talking about. He said, in our life, so many people tell us to live the good life. Get good grades so you can get a good job and a good career to buy a good house, marry a good spouse, get a good car, have a nice, good garage, and hopefully, eventually, have a good retirement. And he said, those things may be good, but they don't lead to the life of a saint. And to me, that, I mean, that just turned everything upside down because, like so many young people, I got that message. Go have a good life. 
And so I think the temptation today for people of all ages is to say, I want to live a good life, but it may not be a saintly life. When I look at the number of people in our congregation who are retired, I'm impressed by the number of people who volunteer and give hours and hours of service, not just to the church, but to other charities. But there's also a warning there, and that there's still people in our vast community of St. Pete and other areas of Gulfport, Pasadena, no matter where you are, who they've retired, but they've also retired from the Christian life. I remember talking with somebody who said, well, I've passed the torch on. I no longer have to volunteer at church because I've hit a certain age. Now keep in mind, this person was physically fit, mentally fit, still able to do work, but they said, my time has passed. And so let me be clear. If you're retired, enjoy it. Enjoy your retirement. Take the cruise. Pick up golf or pickleball or wherever other sport you can still beat Father Alex at. Go to brunch. Do all the things that show that you have earned this time of rest, but please don't retire from pursuing the life of a saint. As I think about those obituaries, I'll often ask people in discussions, have you considered what your obituary will say? If you died today and somebody had to write your obituary, what would it say? Would it only talk about where you went to school, who you rooted for in the playoffs, maybe the number of children and grandchildren that you have, all wonderful things. But in every Christian's obituary, it should be in black and white, in bold-faced letters, at least in my opinion, that this person endeavored to their dying breath to be a saint. To live a saintly life. And so that kind of begs the question, well, what is a saint? Well, the misconceptions of what is a saint are really rampant. First of all, people, many people think that saints are those people who are really holy, and they declare them a saint in Rome. They get written down somewhere, and then we do a Eucharist on their feast day. That's one definition. Other people will say, saints are born not made. And I say, then you've never read the life of a saint. Because almost every saint's life that I've ever read didn't start out with the positive. It started out like a behind the music series from VH1. Okay, where they were not the highlight shining Christian person. There was a transformation that took place. So there's three things I want us to remember about what is a saint so that we can kind of go from here and try to live that life. The first one is a saint is not a person who lived a quote-unquote good, quiet life. They're a person who recognized how amazing God is, how wonderful being in God's presence is, and so they say, that's what I want to strive for. These other things may be nice and comfortable, but that, that is where I want to be, in God's presence. And so they put all their time and energy into their relationship with God. The second characteristic of a saint is not that they necessarily did extraordinary things. Now, some saints in history have done extraordinary things. They have sacrificed their lives as martyrs. They have traveled all over the world to teach people about Jesus, and they're still doing that. But a lot more saints than you think do ordinary things with an extraordinary amount of love. Think about the saints who are parents, who day in and day out care for their children or care for their parents, or care for their siblings, and all the small ways that we just kind of say, well, of course you should do that. 
but they do it with extraordinary love. And see, they're telling me, good job already. <laughs> now, the second aspect of that sainthood is think about all the little things that happen in our parish that nobody sees. The weeds that get removed. The altar that gets set. All the little repairs and things that happen around us. Those are saints. But because it's done with an extraordinary amount of love, that's what God sees. The last thing is that a saint is not a person who's only concerned about getting into heaven. So many Christians that I meet, they're being taught a theology that focuses solely on this idea of, I'm just trying to get into heaven. And once I get there, then everything is fine. And there's a temptation because of that to ignore what's happening in the here and now. And so a saint says, Lord, I recognize that I wish to be with you in eternity, but here and now I want to be transformed so that I can live and love for you. That's why the reading from today's gospel is in the Feast of All Saints. It's the raising of Lazarus. And we had a wonderful discussion about this in, in the Bible study, which I would encourage you to, to, to check out and come to, because it gets very lively. I mean, they called the cops one time on us, okay? And the question was, of all the readings they could have picked for All Saints Day, why in the world did they pick this one? And so we kind of tossed it around a little bit, and this is one of the conclusions we came to, is that this is the last straw for the ones who hate Jesus. For the ones who hated Jesus... This raising of Lazarus from the dead was the last straw because it proved he had the power over life and death. He had the power not just to heal people, but to raise them from the dead. And the same Jesus Christ who does that can do anything. Which means he can transform individuals like us who think we may not have any power, we may not have any influence, we may not have any spiritual gifts, and says, I will transform you into a saint. Now, that sounds daunting at first. But when it's something that we seek on a daily basis, this transformation, it becomes a constant relationship of transformation with God. Now today we celebrate Stewardship Sunday, which is a time when we gather and acknowledge the gifts that we want to present to God, to the church, for the mission and ministry of the church. But there's a line from Rite 1, and I know that you, all of you will know it if you remember Rite 1, is that there's something that we offer to God on this altar. And so if you notice, what are the things that we bring up every single week in the offertory. We bring up bread and wine in our offering. They're all things that have to be transformed by human labor in order for us to use them. We don't eat raw grains. We don't smash raw grapes and pour it into a cup and drink it. They all have to be transformed for God to sanctify and give back to us. And so what we offer on this altar as it says in right one, is ourselves, our souls, and our bodies. You guys remember that line? Isn't it wonderful? And so today, as you come up and you present your pledge, no matter what it is, between you and God, I ask that you say, Lord, I present to you today myself, my soul, and my body in service to you. I don't know how you're going to use it. I don't know what you're going to ask me to do. But I know for sure that you're going to tell me I'm not retired yet. Sorry. <laughs> That's the running gag between us. I'm going to retire before he does. And so I urge all of us 
If you have been working in the vineyard as a saint, thank you. Keep doing it. But if you find you have some spare time, an hour here, an hour there, and you're asking yourself, Lord, what are you asking me to do? Trust me, just raise your hand and say, Lord, I am here and ready. And God will inform you very quickly of where he needs you. And it all begins with that statement I said at the beginning. To those young people, don't waste your life. And to those of you who have long finished your careers, I say humbly, don't waste your retirement. Amen.